Welcome to the NCLEX Review, where I help you review all the things you need to know for NCLEX. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com. Let's review the renal system. So the first thing we're going to cover is just a small review of anatomy and physiology. So the role of the kidneys. So the kidney regulates water and ionic compounds of the body, excretes waste, excretes foreign chemicals, produces glucose during prolonged fasting, and secretes hormones. The three basic renal processes of glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. In addition, the kidneys synthesize and catabolize certain substances. The excretion of a substance is equal to the amount filtered plus the amount excreted minus the amount reabsorbed. So let's talk about normal renal function values. So the first one we have is blood urea nitrogen or BUN, and this is anywhere from 10 to 20. The BUN level indicates the extent of renal clearance of urea nitrogenous waste products. An elevation does not always mean the renal disease is present. Then we have serum creatinine level. In a male, this is going to be from 0.6 to 1.2, and in a female, it's 0.5 to 1.1. Creatinine levels reflect the glomial filtration rate and increases only when 50% of renal function is lost. Then we have a BUN creatinine ratio, and this is going to be anywhere between 6 and 25. And then we have creatinine clearance test. The normal is 125 milliliters per minute. The creatinine clearance test provides the best estimate of glomial filtration rate. It evaluates how well the kidneys remove creatinine from the blood and is an estimate of the glomial filtration rate. The glomial filtration rate decreases with age about 10% per decade, and by age 65, it is 65 milliliters per minute is the average. All right, so let's talk about acute kidney injury. So this happens quickly and is reversible. So let's look at the different phases in laboratory findings. So first we're looking at the onset. It begins with a precipitating event. That's because it's acute and Anything acute, it's not chronic, it's not long-term, it's not untreatable. So acute is something happens that causes a problem that is reversible and fixable. And if it's not reversible or fixable, then it turns into a chronic problem. So it begins with some precipitating event and it has some phases. So the first phase is called the oliguric phase. And during this phase, we're going to see an elevated BUN and serum creatinine levels. We're going to see decreased urine-specific gravity if it's caused by a pre-renal cause, or the urine-specific gravity will be normal if it's an intrarenal cause. Then we'll see a decreased glomial filtration rate and creatinine clearance. We'll see hyperkalemia, normal or reduced sodium, hypervolemia, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia. Then we move on to the diuretic phase. So this is, we're gonna to start to see a gradual decline in the BUN and serum creatinine clearance will still be elevated. These, so both of these will still be elevated, but it's gonna to start to go down. Then we're gonna see a continued low creatinine clearance with improved glomial filtration rate We'll see hypokalemia and hyponatremia, and we'll see hypovolemia. Then we have the recovery phase. So now we're going to start to see an increase in the glomial filtration rate. So it's, it's going up again. We'll start to see a stabilization or continued decline in the BUN and creatinine levels toward normal. And will start to have a complete recovery, but it could take as long as one to two years. So what are our nursing interventions? As we can see, so to be honest, you probably do not need to remember all of the 
hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia in the algeric phase, and then in the diuretic phase, hypokalemia, hyponatremia. Like that's a lot to remember, but an important thing, because that would be a very specific question to get on NCLEX. If you're getting a question like that, you're probably doing really well because that's a very difficult question to memorize all that material. But you'll probably get a question related to electrolytes and nursing intervention. So we should know that with acute kidney injury, you're having electrolyte imbalances. So that's a big thing. So monitoring electrolyte levels is important. And specifically, we remember that potassium is the most risky when that one is out of balance. So if it's asking you like, what is your priority electrolyte to monitor with an acute kidney injury or something like that, and potassium is one of the answers, go with that because that's where you're going to have the cardiac abnormalities and things like that. But monitoring electrolytes, important with kidney injuries. Monitor blood pressure and vital signs. Monitor intake and output with daily weights. All of these are really important. The interventions are really what you should memorize. We want to remember renal disease, so that's a low-protein, high-carb diet. They may need dialysis, and we may need to monitor for acidosis. The treatment for acidosis is sodium bicarbonate, chronic kidney disease. So this now is a slow, progressive, and irreversible loss of kidney function. So a normal glomerular filtration rate is going to be 90 Mild chronic kidney disease will be anywhere between 60 and 89. Normal, mild, okay. And then moderate chronic kidney disease, glomial filtration rate is 30 to 59. Severe is gonna be 15 to 29. And end stage is a glomial filtration rate less than 15. This is gonna require dialysis which is the process of filtering the patient's blood and removing wastes. Patients are at risk for fluid overload and hyperkalemia. So these are things we should be monitoring for. So now when we talk about our nursing interventions during dialysis, we're monitoring for hypovolemia and shock. We're monitoring for bleeding. We're gonna hold antitensive and meds that could be removed during dialysis, such as water-soluble vitamins, antibiotics, or digoxin. We're gonna monitor for arterial steel syndrome in patients with internal AV fistulas, which is too much blood is sent to the vein that the arterial perfusion to the hand is compromised. And we'll palpate for a thrill or oscillate a brewy to ensure the fistula is pending. This is when you use your stethoscope and you put it on the fistula, whether it's wherever it is on the arm, et cetera, and you're listening for a whooshing sound, and that's showing that the blood is passing through there and it's working properly. Let's talk about an air embolism in a client with dialysis. So how do we treat this? We stop the hemodialysis, we turn the client on the left side with the head down, which is Trendelenburg position, notify the healthcare provider and rapid response team, administer oxygen, assess vital signs and pulse, and document the event actions taken and client's response. So you may get a question on NCLEX, like the way NCLEX will ask questions, is like what do you do first? What is the priority? It is never contact the healthcare provider. There's always something that you should do first and we're thinking patient safety. So if they're like, there's an air embolism, what do you do? So first stop the hemodialysis, turn the patient on the left slide with the head down in Trendelenburg position. Then you notify the healthcare provider. Okay, now let's talk about kidney transplant. So a transplant can come from a living or deceased donor they must have the same blood type and antibodies. The patient will be on an immunosuppressive medication for life. So our nursing interventions are going to be to monitor urine output, which starts immediately after the transplant, daily weights, and semi-fowler's position. We want to remember to instruct the client following a kidney transplant to avoid prolonged periods of sitting, Monitor intake and output of urine. 
recognize the signs and symptoms of infection and rejection, use medication as prescribed, and maintain immunosuppressive therapy for life, avoid contact sports, and avoid exposure to people who have infections. So what are the signs of rejection? So a temperature higher than 100 degrees, pain or tenderness over the grafted kidney, a two to three pound weight gain in 24 hours, edema, hypertension, malice, elevated blood, urea, nitrogen, and serum creatinine levels, decreased creatinine clearance, and elevated white blood cell count. All right, let's talk about a UTI. So UTIs may experience cloudy, malodorous, or bloody urine. There are two types of UTIs. So we have a lower UTI. This is in the urethrus, cystitis due to ascending pathogens such as E. coli. Signs and symptoms are frequency, urgency, and burning. Then we have an upper UTI. These are things like polynephritis due to urine reflux from the bladder into the ureters or obstruction causing inflammation. These signs and symptoms are calculi, structure, and an enlarged prostate. Nursing interventions, we want to give them antibiotics and monitor for confusion in the elderly. This is a big thing. When elderly people get UTIs, they can really be delirious in things. And then continuous bladder irrigation removes clotted blood from the bladder post-terp, which is a three-way catheter that is used. Nursing interventions report pain and spasms, which indicate obstruction. Report if output is less than the input, which indicates a clot or kink, and titrate irrigation rate so that urine is light pink. Let's review the reproductive system. So first, let's talk about irregularities associated with menses. So we have amenorrhea, which is characterized by a lack of or uncharacteristic pause of menses. Then we have dysmenorrhea. This is painful menses hypomenorrhea, which is a limited period or period of short duration, hypermenorrhea, this is extensive menses, algeomenorrhea, this is irregular menses, polymenorrhea, this is abnormally frequent menses, and anoovulation cycle is characterized by a menstrual cycle in which a woman does not ovulate. Okay, now let's talk about endometriosis. So endometriosis is the occurrence of endometrial tissue in an area other than the uterine cavity. The signs and symptoms are painful intercourse, dysmenorrhea, which is painful menses, dyschezia, difficulty produ producing stool, pelvic pain, premenstrual spotting, and spontaneous abortion. Then we have pelvic inflammatory disease. This is an acute or chronic inflammation of the endometrion, uterine tubes, and pelvic peritoneum. So chronic or acute inflammation caused by either gonorrhea, chlamydia, and is usually the end product of an untreated STD. So signs and symptoms, pain and vaginal bleeding, nausea, vomiting, purulent drainage, fever, and elevated white blood count. Okay. Let's talk about sexually transmitted diseases. So first we have chlamydia. This is a sexually transmitted bacterial infection. In males, we're gonna see things like urethritis, epididymitis, proctitis, and Reader's syndrome. In females, we're gonna see cervicitis and urethritis, inflammation or infected Barthonian glands and pelvic inflammatory disease. Then we have gonorrhea. This is a contagious inflammation of the genital mucosa and may affect the genital tract, both upper and lower, the urethra, endocervix, peritoneum, the heart, and any joints in the body and any other area via the bloodstream. We're gonna see polyuria, painful urination, and discharge. Then we have syphilis. This can invade any system within the body and cause damage to bone, tissues, and nerve. We'll see fever, eruptions of mucosal patches on the skin, lymphadectopathy, a painless 
canker papule that manifests 0.3 up to 2 centimeters non-tender ulcer that has a formed border with a yellowish base, flu-like symptoms, and a rash. Then we have human papillomary virus, or HPV. Things we will see include venereal warts, so characterized by a growth of warts on the anal or genital area may appear as a single or in clusters and are fleshy skin colored and may be soft to touch. Signs and symptoms are soft, sessile, having a broad base of attachment tumors, may be smooth or rough, paritis itching and bleeding at the site. And our nursing interventions are we should educate that females should have a pap smear at 21 years old. And then we have pubic lice. And our interventions for this are lice shampoo, remove nits with a fine tip comb, wash belongings separately from others, and sexual partners need to be treated as well. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com.